It's the Real News. I'm Ben Norton. India's far-right Prime Minister Narendra Modi traveled to London this week to meet with top UK officials. Modi met with Conservative Prime Minister Theresa May, and the two are pursuing a free trade deal that could bring British and Indian corporations billions of dollars. As soon as he arrived, however, protesters in the UK flooded the streets, condemning the Modi government and its ruling party, the BJP, for stoking violence against women, Muslims, and Dalits, or lower caste people. Specifically, many protesters condemned the Indian government for refusing to take action over a horrific case in the village of Katua in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. An eight-year-old Muslim girl named Asifa Bano was kidnapped, held in a Hindu temple, drugged, and then gang-raped and murdered. Several men have been accused of the attack, including a police officer. Joining us to discuss the protests against Modi in London is Amrit Wilson. Amrit is a writer and activist. She is a founding member of the South Asia Solidarity Group, which helped organize the protests, and she is the author of several books. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ben. Of course. Um, so can you speak, let's just begin here talking about the protests. You're a member of the South Asia Solidarity Group, which helped organize the demonstrations. Why did you all go out to protest Modi? Well, people in London and in Britain generally were, particularly people in the diaspora, were extremely angry at what's happening in India. Um, there, is, um, there is a myth which has been propagated by the BJP that all uh, diasporic Indians are pro-Modi, they're pro-Hindutva, and they're pro the BJP. And we just wanted to show that this wasn't the case. So we've been planning these protests as soon as we knew he was going to come. Um, and then the news of the Asifa case, of course, broke, and people felt really that this was intolerable. Um, and huge number of people joined us. Um, from the diaspora and from other countries of South Asia as well. And then can you speak more about the Asifa case? I mean, I'll, this hasn't gotten a lot of attention here in the Western media, but this is a really horrific case. And unfortunately, it's not isolated either. There have been similar instances uh, of violence, particularly against Muslims and women in India. Yes, I mean, rape culture is endemic in India anyway. But this is something new because here you have um, the perpetrators are members of the ruling party and um, after the rape, after these murders, they are then celebrated by ministers and other leaders of the BJP. So this is um, something entirely new and it's very important to see it in this way because um, it's like saying that some people really are not part of the nation. Some people simply do not have any rights. Some people can be killed. Um, and this is, this is an extension of what's been going on um, since Modi took power. In fact, in the, in the years before that, when the BJP was becoming powerful, it, it had started, but it got much worse um, after 2014 when Modi came to power. Yeah, and for context for listeners, uh, for the past four years, since, as, as I mentioned, the 2014 election, India has been ruled by the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, which is extremely right wing. And Prime Minister Modi and the party follow, uh, they're Hindu nationalists who follow an ideology known as Hindutva. Um, and, and under this pro-Hindutva government, uh, communal violence and sectarian violence have skyrocketed. And uh, extremist pro-Hindutva groups, specifically um, the RSS, which is a paramilitary that's linked to the BJP, and other groups have launched attacks against Muslims, Dalits, women. Um, so can you speak about the state of accelerating communal and sectarian violence and tension in India? And how do you see this play out in the diaspora as well, Amrit? Well, um, the, um, India has really become uh, what we in our, um, in our organization have called it. It's a republic of fear because mob lynching is extremely common. Um, there have been so many cases of Muslims being attacked um, on, on the pretext that they have eaten beef or they have um, slaughtered cows. And sometimes, of course, there's no pretext is needed simply because they are Muslims. 
I mean, there was a case of a 15-year-old boy who was traveling on a train to go and do some shopping for Eid, at the Muslim festival, and uh, he was set upon and brutally murdered on the train and then left on a platform. Um, you know, his body was left and, and nobody uh, had the courage to go and, and see what had happened to him. So these appalling incidents have been happening in India. There was another case more recently of a man called Afrazul Khan, who uh, was um, a, a migrant worker in Rajasthan. And um, he was uh, killed, he was attacked with an axe and, and killed and his body was burnt. And the most, one of the appalling things was that this was all videoed by a 14 year old boy who was the nephew of the, um, the murderer. Um, and once it went um, onto the internet, it was being celebrated by Modi supporters, some of whom actually uh, are followed by Modi on Twitter. So this is exactly. the kind of atmosphere which, which is ongoing in India. Exactly. And we actually saw in the case of Asif Abano, this young girl in Jammu and Kashmir who was murdered, uh, we saw that two ministers from the BJP, the ruling party, in fact, attended protests that were rallied in support of the accused rapists and killers. Can you speak about this as well? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there was the Hindu Ekta Manch, which is a right wing Hindu outfit, a pro Modi outfit. They organized this protest and the um, two ministers came out and one of them said that um, the fact that the um, accused had been arrested um, showed that this was a jungle raj, as he called it, and this should not have happened, and that people should go all out to stop this prosecution. Um, and in fact, um, he, even after the, the first protest, he called another protest. So it's, it's, there is total lawlessness apart from anything else. And BJP um, supporters and leaders can do exactly what they want to. And during the Asifa, as the Asifa case um, surfaced, we also highlighted another case in a place called Unnao in um, Uttar Pradesh, which is um, one of the large states in North Central India. Um, which is ruled by, with the chief minister as a man called Yogi right. And, you know, he is one of the most notorious um, uh, hate preachers, uh, which the Hidupta Brigade have. Um, he, uh, you know, he, in, this, the, in the Onna case, um, um, BJP uh, leader raped uh, a, a young, a teenager, and uh, the police took no action whatsoever. When the family put pressure on, on the police and so on, um, the man um, came and, and uh, her father was, uh, was beaten up so viciously that, um, you know, he, he, was, he should have been taken to hospital. But in fact, he was locked up in a police cell and he died. Yeah, and what, what a lot of Americans, unfortunately, many don't follow the uh, politics in India. What they don't realize is that uh, Uttar Pradesh is the size of Brazil. This is uh, an, an enormous state. Of course, India itself has 1.3 billion people, and it's being ruled by, as you mentioned, Yogi Adityanath, who is a very extreme Hindu nationalist who has repeatedly called for uh, Muslims to be killed if they have even touched Hindu women. Uh, he has actually stoked a lot of communal violence and it, uh, th is involved with uh, Hindutva paramilitary groups. Um, so finally, we have to conclude this part here, but um, I think what this is all is interesting, what, what's interesting is that this all largely relates not just to communal violence, but also it's largely patriarchal and gendered violence. Um, we mentioned the case of Asifa, and you have mentioned the case of Muslim men who have been accused of so-called love jihad. Um, so frequently, it's about controlling women, controlling their bodies, and and imposing violence in order to maintain that kind of domination. I know you've written a lot about, um, you know, the legacy of British colonialism, which was brutal and genocidal, and also the legacy of um, patriarchy that, that still continues today throughout the world, of course. It's not unique to India, but can you talk about the intersection 
of, of these forms of violence? Absolutely. I think colonialism had its own form of, of, uh, um, of a repressive repression and masculinity, which came out of white masculinity. But what we see in Hindutva is also a form of masculinity, which is, um, which is truly vicious in the sense that it's um, anti-Muslim, it's uh, connected up with, with the Hindu nation, and it means that Hindu men are, are urged to be aggressive. Um, in fact, um, one of the um, icons of Hindutva, a man called Savarkar, um, has written that Hindu men must rape Muslim women, and if they do not do so, it's, it's suicidal for the Hindu nation. So this idea of masculinity and the nation are completely tied up. And it also reflects on the kind of aggressive stand which India is now taking as a country towards other countries in the region. Well, unfortunately, we'll have to wrap it up here, but please join us for part two of our discussion. Uh, Amrit and I will be discussing how uh, the notion that the BJP is this kind of fascist party is true in, in certain elements, absolutely, and how it stokes this, you know, sectarian and communal violence. But also what the BJP does is combine neoliberalism with this fascistic ideology. So please join us for part two. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Yes, great. Reporting for The Real News, I'm Ben Norton.